crystal field theory is a model that describes the electronic structure of the d electrons within transition metal complexes using this idea that the field of negative point charges created by the ligands will perturb the energies of the d electrons let's start by rev reviewing the basic idea of crystal field theory and crystal field splitting let's imagine we started with just a bare iron 2 cation first no ligands just bare iron 2 plus iron 2 plus is a d6 cation d electron count of six double check the periodic table if you need to verify that and so to fill the degenerate the five degenerate d orbitals in the naked or bare cation we just follow hun's rule avoiding pairing as much as we can to get this electron configuration now let's imagine bringing in six water ligands in an octahedral arrangement around the iron two center. What happens is a splitting of the d orbitals into two sets of energy levels, the higher energy E sub G and the lower energy T sub two G. And this is what happens in the iron two hexaquo complex. We've talked about this idea of splitting, but we haven't really talked about filling electrons into these split d orbitals and if you think about how these look in this particular case this might look a little bit odd to you right why didn't we pair up these electrons in the lower energy t2g orbitals why are these apparently at a higher energy in the e sub g level avoiding pairing rather than lower in energy it looks like the lowest energy electron configuration should have these electrons at a lower energy level right not quite, not quite, and this is where we're deepening our understanding of crystal field theory. Keep in mind that there's an energetic penalty associated with pairing electrons, because two electrons paired in the same orbital have the same probability distribution, meaning they're relatively close in space, and they tend to repel each other more than electrons that are in spatially distinct orbitals. That repulsion carries an energetic penalty that we call the pairing energy. And in cases when the crystal field theory, uh, crystal field splitting, this delta oct value, is relatively small, small relative to the pairing energy, it's actually energetically favorable to avoid pairing the electrons, placing these electrons in the higher energy E sub G level to avoid pairing rather than pairing them up in the T2G level. And so in cases where delta oct is relatively small, we see this relatively high number of unpaired electrons. And this is why this matters. We're going to see that in cases where the crystal field splitting is larger, the number of paired, uh, unpaired electrons will be different. So here we have four unpaired electrons as a result of this avoiding pairing as much as we can. And this occurs in cases when delta oct is relatively small, the pairing energy relatively large. And it leads to what we'll call a high spin complex. Before we get to the high spin, low spin terminology, I want to describe the low spin situation. Now what we want to note is that the extent of crystal field splitting, the size of delta oct, the size of this energy gap, depends on the identity of the ligand. So now let's imagine swapping out those six water ligands for six cyanides, creating this anionic complex, FEC and 6, 4 minus. Still octahedral, still iron 2, still 6d electrons. The big difference here is that delta oct is much larger in this case. Cyanide is what we'll call a strong field ligand that causes large crystal field splitting, all other things being equal. So this gap is much larger, and now in this case, delta oct is greater than the pairing energy. And so now, the energetic penalty associated with electron pairing is actually less than this gap, and so the overall lowest energy situation involves putting all of the electrons in the lower energy T2G orbital and going ahead and pairing them up. Notice that in this complex, we have no unpaired electrons. The number of unpaired electrons is zero, and so the net spin of the complex is zero. Keep in mind, each electron carries a spin with it, up or down, plus one half or minus one half. And so now we can see why in this case where delta oct is relatively large, this is called a low spin complex since the net spin here is zero. On the other hand, when delta oct is relatively small, well now I've got 
four unpaired electrons, a total spin of plus two, right? This is what we'll call a low spin. This is what we'll call a high spin complex. So we can see here how the ligand, and in particular the ligand's influence on the crystal field splitting, influences the number of unpaired electrons in the complex with relatively weak field ligands that cause weak splitting leading to high spin complexes with unpaired electrons in the higher energy eg orbitals while strong field ligands that cause a strong crystal field splitting result in all of the electrons pairing pairing as much as possible in the lower energy t2g level and a low spin overall there is an order of ligands from weakest field, smallest crystal field splitting, to strongest field, highest crystal field splitting, and it's known as the spectrochemical series. The spectrochemical series is listed on this slide. I highly encourage you to put it on your crib sheet in this form. It's not something you should memorize by any means. There's also a big gray area here in the middle. These ligands that can lead to high spin or low spin complexes depending on the identity of the metal. What I would say is that at cyanide and carbon monoxide and beyond, we are definitely in a low spin situation. At iodide, bromide, and chloride, we're definitely at a high spin situation, and there's a large gray area in the middle. This is much more about comparison, right? Recognizing a difference between, say, a cyanide complex and a water complex, than concluding whether any particular complex of any particular ligand is high spin or low spin. Just to talk a little bit more about the spectrochemical series to kind of get un under the hood a little bit of this, we can note that, generally speaking, and there are exceptions, so this is a big generalization, but generally, more Lewis basic ligands, stronger Lewis bases, are stronger fields. So for example, hydroxide is a stronger field ligand than iodide, hydroxide being a stronger Lewis base than iodide. However, it's also true that relatively Lewis acidic ligands are also stronger field, carbon monoxide, comes to mind. Carbon monoxide contains a pi bond that is polarized away from the metal center, and this polarization away from the metal center actually makes the crystal field splitting stronger for reasons that are way beyond the scope of introductory chemistry, but just an interesting pattern worth knowing that when we have carbon heteroatom pi bonds, carbon nitrogen double or triple bonds, carbon oxygen double bond, that tends to make these ligands relatively strong field. The nitrogen oxygen double bond built into NO2 minus is another good example of this. And so just to sum up, you won't be responsible for the detailed explanation here, and I encourage you to put the spectrochemical series on your crib sheet just so you have it handy. It's something you are going to apply, but in a comparative sense primarily, looking at two different complexes and distinguishing between, for example, which one is likely to give a high spin complex versus a low spin complex with the same identity of the metal center in both complexes. Here we're going to put the spectrochemical series into practice by predicting the number of unpaired electrons in each coordination complex. And I just have to note here that finding the number of unpaired electrons is very important for magnetic properties, and we're going to dig into that in the near future. Now, each of these contains a complex ion. And so the first thing we want to do in each case is just split this compound into its component ions and essentially throw away the counter ions and just focus on the complex ion. So here, for example, it's the hexa-iodo-chromium complex here, chromium-3, that uh, is the important bit of this. And we can note that the chromium is in the plus three oxidation state based on the overall charge and the negative one charge on the iodide ligands, and so this is a D3 situation. Now, in thinking about the number of unpaired electrons, we go to crystal field theory and generate the typical sort of trapezoidal arrangement of orbital energies for the D orbitals, three on bottom and two on top, and we start filling with electrons following Hund's rule. Keep in mind what you already know. Hund's rule will still be followed. And with three unpaired electrons, well, we don't even have a high spin, low spin issue really here, right? This is true for D3, D2, and D1, and of course D0. There is not even a high or low spin issue since we're going to follow Hund's rule and put all of the electrons in the lower energy T2G orbitals, not even have to worry, having to worry about high spin or low spin. 
So we'd end up with three unpaired electrons, one each in each of the T2G orbitals in accordance with Hund's rule. Simple as that. All right, let's move on to B, this copper complex. This is a copper ethylene diamine complex with a plus two charge and two chloride counter ions, which we're gonna throw away. Now, both the ethylene diamine and water ligands are neutral, meaning that copper is in the plus two oxidation state, and this corresponds to D9. Now, here in the D9 case, we're kind of on the other side of the coin. We've got so many electrons in the D orbitals that we're literally filled to the brim. And there is, again, no high spin or low spin issue. With D8, D9, and of course D10, there's only one way to fill up all of these, uh, to fill all of these electrons into the split d orbitals and what we end up with here is of course one unpaired electron it's that one electron in the higher energy eg orbitals that doesn't have a partner in this d9 uh, complex at the d9 copper center now where things get really interesting is in case c case c has this cobalt nitrite complex co no 26 three minus and if we do the oxidation state and charge math here we find that this is cobalt three a d6 cation so we've got six d electrons to fill in and there are now two different ways to do this depending on whether we're dealing with a strong field or weak field ligand now no2 is pretty reliably a strong field ligand so i've deliberately drawn a large gap between the lower energy and higher energy levels in the octahedral splitting here and how are we going to fill electrons well we're going to pair as soon as we get the chance based on Hund's rule. So we start by adding three into the T2G orbitals and we're gonna to continue to pair electrons because the pairing energy is less than the crystal field spl splitting for this strong field ligand. So we end up with an orbital energy diagram that looks like this, no unpaired electrons at all. Think about what would happen if we replaced NO2 with a weak field ligand like iodide. Imagine cobalt hexaiodo three minus. What would happen in that case? How many unpaired electrons would the complex have? It's a little homework for you. 